Who's here? This Hello. is exciting. <laughs> Get to take off work in the middle of the day and hang out here. Uh, thank you all for coming and joining us, for everybody else for watching. Um, we're thrilled. You can be here. Thrilled Pat can be here. Um, I'm going to ask some questions up here for a little bit, and then we're going to take questions from you guys for a little bit. So think about what it is that you want to ask Mr. Monahan. And uh, I guess let's start. Let's, let's talk a little bit uh, about the record. Bulletproof Picasso, recently out. Um, was there a... Uh, you know, was there a goal? Was there a target for this album for you guys going in? Something that you that you wanted to uh, accomplish this time out? Yeah, you know, you never you never know uh, what success is until later. You know, sometimes it's uh, hit songs and sometimes it's growth. And this was a a very much a growth kind of a a goal for me as a songwriter to write songs that I cared about, but with less cutesy lyrics like. Uh, I can get kind of into a zone where I use too many soy latte lines, and uh, so I tried to use less of those, which on some level they're memorable, but on other levels uh, they, they kind of get in the way. So it's much harder for me to not do that, and so I tried to do that on this album, and it was really difficult. And so hopefully I'll grow as a songwriter into the next phase. Yeah, I know you've said that this was a this was a particularly hard one to write, a hard one to to find the songs. What was, uh, what was it that was difficult, and how do you how do you break through that once you're feeling the difficulty? I found was uh, the amount of wine I drink <clears throat> uh, to take time away from drinking wine to write songs was just difficult to find the time. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that joke. Um, the, the, the difficulty is trying to write songs that potentially people will care about. You know, like uh, when I wrote Marry Me, it was 50 seconds long, and I was like, oh, this is perfect, 50 seconds, it's a love song, just the way it should be, and my manager was like, can't wait till you finish it. And, uh, and I was like, I don't really want to finish it because it's cool like this, and he was like, but it's on its way to being important to people. And... That's hard to do, and I, I sometimes get lucky, and most times don't. Was there, uh, you know, was there any one of these songs where you could, you know, where you could feel it click, where you could get a sense of like, oh, okay, I see where this thing might be yeah, going? Yeah, there was one song uh, that we're going to shoot a video for at the end of the month. It's called Give It All, and that was the song that, when it was written, I was like, if that's the one song that people hear, I'll be good with this album. And so then we put out three other songs instead. <laughs> Terrible planning. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What was it? What, why, what, what did that one break through? You know, it just is an emotional song that as soon as I, I, I wrote it in New York with a, a kid that I never wrote with before, uh, named Amir, and he's a lovely kid. And I went to JFK afterwards and listened to it in headphones and and just cried because I felt like I broke through something in myself that was honest. And then I sent it to my wife and then she cried. And then my manager cried. And then the whole world crying. <laughs> uh, and so that just made sense to me that a song like that that's pulling the same emotion out of all of us should be heard by others. And I don't know, we'll see if, uh, if it gets a chance to be heard. So uh, let's let's talk a bit about this about the tour, about the Picasso at the Wheel tour going out next month, right? You start up. Yeah, you know Matt uh, Nathanson and and Train. We've known each other for twenty years. Uh, he's a San Francisco kid, and we're a San Francisco band. And he's uh, got a great sense of humor, uh, and he's a terrible person, just like me. Uh, so we get along great. And the Fray, you know, I uh, we met them years ago and have never toured together. So this will be a lot of fun to to finally do that with those guys. And any way that you're going into, you know, that you're going into it with, well, at this point in a career, this many records in, this many songs in, is it, you know, what's the, what's the challenge of getting a set list together, feeling like the old songs and the new songs can, can play nice with each other? Is it hard to connect to some of the older things that you've got to work yourself up to? And what's a, it's got to be a different thing, you know, this many times around to be 
figuring out what you do on a stage. Well, you know, with social media the way it is, we can ask people what they want to hear. And uh, they're not shy about telling us, uh, man, you shouldn't have played that crap. Uh, I wish you would have played this other stuff. That's awesome. And, and then we'll put lists together. But the difficulty for me is, like, we just came back from the UK and Australia where we have minimal amounts of lights and production. And so it's all music. It's, uh, it's all about music, and it's successful like that sometimes. So when we go out this summer, we'll bring a lot of lights and production. So we have to be careful, first of all, not to get too caught in the production and make it about music and just let the production highlight the music. So that's one thing. And then to try to do things different than we've done on the last five tours that we've done in the summer. Uh, you know, like we were out with uh, with Maroon 5 like five years ago and we did a dance routine and had this drum thing and, and it was really interesting and people would write about like, that was weird, I gotta go see it again tomorrow. And uh, this time we have to come up with something weird. I don't know what it's gonna be, uh, but I'd like you guys to all be involved. <laughs> sort of an audience participation kind yeah, of like, a thing, yeah. Like every night we'll like throw you in a ring with a with another person in the audience, and we'll sing a song, and you guys can do weird stuff to each other. I'm sure, everybody signs the legal yeah, waivers you're have to first. Sign a form, of yeah. course. Uh, but is it, you know, is it tough to go back to, or to find which of the songs from the catalog are the ones that feel right at this moment? Does that change? Do you find new things in the older songs sometimes? Are there some that are like, I don't even know who the guy was who wrote that? Um, yeah, integrating it, that stuff. It gets weird. Then, and, and then the, the list of must plays, the, the list gets longer because we're just always going to be a band that wants people to hear the songs that they love and sing along. You know, there are f the most proud part of all of this for me is that families come to see us. So, uh, adults, really old adults, and uh, adults uh, younger. And their kids and grandkids, everybody comes, and no one has to make anyone come. They all come because they knew Meet Virginia and they know Hey Soul Sister or whatever the combination of those songs is. And that's really exciting for me, you know. So uh, I keep all my cursing to my podcast, uh, which is called the Patcast. If you're into cursing, you definitely want to go to patcast.com. Uh, and then on stage, I, I keep it so that it's, it's right for everybody. So the band now is seven members strong. Yeah. Um, what's, you know, which, which drives, do you find players that you want, you want to keep close and, and, and bring them on board? Or do you find the songs need additional parts, different parts, uh, as, as the, you know, as the actual number of people on stage has expanded, you know, where does that come from and sort of which, which comes first? It's a strange process. You know, we, we started as five guys who all met in San Francisco. And as time changes or time moves on, people change, things change. The alternative to band members changing is bands breaking up. So you gotta go like, what is right? What, what would our fans want? Do they want us all to go our own way and I just start making pat songs or whatever? Or do people believe and train and so we can build from there? And so as time goes on, choosing people instead of, hey man, we all met, we're the band, it becomes a big part of what you end up doing. And, and then the older you get, the more you realize that it's not about money, it's not about fame or radio, it's about enjoying your life. And then we can do that more because we choose great people. And so we're seven people that all get along incredibly well. We want to do this, and so we'll put on a better show for everybody. It's pretty simple, but you have to, you have to be able to deal with older fans that are like, without that guy, I'm not here anymore. And then you go like, well, I hope you come back. You know, I'm not mad at you because I get it, but I hope you come back. Those relationships change too. I mean, That's right. I mean, and um, they're wrong and we're right. <laughs> <laughs> Just figured I'd throw that out there. Makes it all, that makes it all very simple. <laughs> <laughs> That's very simple. 
uh, it said that uh, the last time that I saw you was at a, uh, a benefit event for the Country Music Hall of Fame uh, that you did with Greg Allman and Vince Gill and a bunch of people, and, and you, know, you were working a lot with the singer Ashley Monroe. Um, what is being in and around that community a little bit? Uh, you know, did it open your eyes to anything? Did that, did that filter into the, the process of, of this record of these songs? Yeah, it's, it's really intimidating, you know, when you're around people that you're a f fan of or that were on some level musical heroes or people you look up to, uh, like both Vince Gill and, and Greg Allman. It's hard to be around them. Like, I remember the first time I met Howard Stern, I, I was such a huge fan that I just, just kept my mouth shut instead of trying to be funny, Howard Sterny. Uh, it's just best to be respectful, and I, I try to behave the same way around people like Vince Gill and uh, Greg Allman because that's what they deserve. And anything out of, you know, the, the obviously there's been such an explosion on the country music side of new listeners, new people listening. Um, anything in that, just that, that world and that way of thinking about things that, that, uh, that, was, that was different or that brought anything new to the way that the way that you think about music about songwriting or you know I think I've always written songs uh, similar to country artists and I think we are a, a, a rock pop band that's very similar to country bands as opposed to other rock pop bands I think it's uh, the nature of the kind of people we are and what kind of music we like and maybe our age as well I mean we've been doing this for a long time and our your your what you like changes and so I tend to you know love older artists that wrote songs that had guitars in them and, and weird stuff like that um, so I think we've always related to the country world and maybe someday we'll lean harder on that level but I, I think for now we just have to be who we are and see what happens any other uh any new new influences, new favorites, things you were listening to when these songs were getting written? Uh, yeah, you know, it's always fun for, I'll just send tweets out to fans of Train that uh, I'll say, what should I be listening to? And so I remember hearing Hosier a year before there was music here, you know. Uh, and I remember my son playing me the Gautier video you know, six months before it was a video here and it had 20 million hits in other parts of the world. Uh, we just did a tour with uh, two great acts, uh, Natasha North and The Magic Numbers, which are both UK bands uh, in, uh, in, in the UK. So we were there and uh, I don't know, we, we just did a show with Jimmy Cliff in Australia. Like it was, it's a, it, being surrounded by music is just, you, all, you can find something great in everything. I just met Jack Johnson for the first time, and uh, I love that guy's music. There's a, there's a lot to love out there. I just wanted to ask about uh, working with, you were, uh, worked with, with Butch Walker, produced this record, who I don't know if people know, but Butch is an amazing yeah, singer-songwriter unto himself, but also worked with every, you know, produced Fall Out Boy and Keith Urban and worked with Taylor Swift and, you know, a huge range of people. Um, what was, what's, at this, again, after this many years, this many records, all of that, what does bringing in a, a producer, a new producer like that, uh, bring, bring out of the songs and the performances? Well, you know, you always want to, you always want a producer who's more talented than you and everyone in your band, and uh, Butch is definitely that guy, and he, uh, he would be very intimidating if he wasn't such a sweet, wonderful friend. And uh, he loves us through records, and that's, what, that's what's so great about him. And he knows how to just be himself, you know, which is it's hard to do because, you, you know, it's hard for us to trust ourselves that we're cool enough to just be who we are. Uh, do you guys work here? Are you getting paid to sit here and listen to this? <laughs> because if I was out there, I'd be like, I'm fucking out of here. <laughs> Sorry. Fans and true believers. <laughs> Not answering that, you'll know. Um, so one more, I want to ask one more thing, and then we'll, we'll go to questions from them and see what it is they actually want to hear. Um, tell me about, uh, there's been a bunch of, of different charity efforts from the band through the wine, through the tour, through lots of stuff. Um, just tell us a little bit about what, 
you know, what stuff you're doing and sure. why that's become such an important piece of, of training now. Well, you know, when Hey Soul Sister became our comeback uh, opportunity, um, we didn't know that there would ever be another moment where people would care about us. And one of the things that we really wanted to try to do is never forget again. Like, you can do it once, but if you do it more than once, then you're a knucklehead. And, and what we remembered mostly is that San Francisco built this band, gave us a chance, let us go, you know, experiment around the world and, and, and gain love and trust uh, in other countries. But really, any charity, I think, that works starts locally. And so we, we created a, a, a relationship with a place called The Family House, which houses really sick kids and their families that have low income in their lives. And so these kids come from all over to go to UCSF, which is a hospital there with, that works on a lot of cancer with children. And uh, so we started working with them just with our, our music and you know shows and, and donating money and time. And then we uh, partnered with some people in the Bay Area and started making wine. So we made our first red blend called uh, uh, Drops of Jupiter. We, we name our wines after song titles, and uh, they're really nice wines, actually. And uh, they, it started to grow and grow. We, it's called the Save Me San Francisco Wine Company. We partnered with a, a chocolate company in San Francisco and uh, started making chocolate. So these proceeds go to a family house, and uh, they've been able to do some great things because of that. And we've been able to feel like we're, uh, we're saying thank you directly to San Francisco. Let's go out there. You guys have the you have the mic. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you had any plans to collaborate with any artists um, in the near future that we could be looking out for. If I had the longing to collaborate with some artists? Yeah, or anything in the works or, or yeah, definitely if you don't have anything in the works, something that you would I like to do. I always do. You know, uh, a friend of mine uh, named L King is oh, we love really LK. starting to get popular. And she's been trying to get popular for a long time, doing a lot of hard work and really great work. So I'm going to get her on my podcast tonight. And, uh, and I'd love for her to sing on one of my songs so she can make me cool. Because she's really cool, and you can tell already in the conversation that I've had with you all that I am not. So that's where we're at with that. Oh, we love Elle King. I figure, find something, something fun to do with her. Yeah. I think everything she does is fun. Hey, how's it going? All right, so I have to disagree. I think you and the rest of the band are very cool. So my question as a fan is a nostalgia question. When Drops of Jupiter became number one on the billboard for the year, for the adult contemporary for the year, and for the top five of the Hot 100 for the year. Can you take me back to that? Like, where were you guys when you found out that it was like number one for the year on the year-end charts and all that? Just a nostalgia question. When it was, num it was number one where? Uh, on the Billboard year-end, um, uh, adult contemporary, and it was like number four, number three You know, three that, was a for the strange, year that was a strange year for us because we really needed we needed to uh, learn a lot of lessons. And one of them was uh, how to not be a bunch of bozos. And instead, we had a hit song, which just enhanced the bozo. And uh, we were traveling the world, and we started to get a little bit like, um, a little bit entitled. And so it took a long time to recover from the entitlement where that song got so big, but the band didn't. Like, and that's the way it is with all train songs, uh, which is awesome in the end. At first, you go like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Don't you recognize me? Can I get a free pizza? And, uh, and then after a while, you get to go shopping, and no one will bother you. And if they do, they just say, hey, can I have a picture? They don't like pull your face off or whatever. So you really learn to love the the part that you hate in the beginning, which is how come we're not big like Coldplay? Why isn't, you know, like we won a Grammy and it beat out one of their songs, they became the biggest band in the world and we continued to be a bunch of bozos. 
So, like, this is, like, all lessons that we really needed to learn. So there wasn't a moment of clarity that the song brought us, but it, it really created an opportunity for us to learn bigger lessons, which was we love our fans, but we didn't have, we, we weren't in touch with that for a while. It was, like, never enough. It wasn't good enough. Nothing was good enough, and we really learned a lot of lessons, and Drops of Jupiter was... It took us from a little indie band that college kids liked to like a pop band. So we lost all of the indie rock, you know, cred and fans and entered a new world. So we had to figure out what that meant. And so, uh, but anyway, I, I couldn't be more grateful for the song because it was a, an enormous gift from the universe. Like I dreamt that song and woke up and it was written in an hour. I don't feel like I wrote it. I feel like my mom wrote it for me. So, so two things. I just got to say to my mom, thanks, and can you send me another song? Because that song was really sweet. I know you mentioned the UK and Australia, and I was just wondering if you have a favorite place to perform. You know, I, I, I'll be honest about Australia, we have played there for 20 years and have never really grown past like this certain place. And so I was like, you know, I think maybe we're going to just go there one last time. And uh, we went there and played two shows and then we had a festival to do called Byron Bay. And I just really wasn't expecting much. And it was one of the most memorable shows of my life. And then I was like, we got to come back here tomorrow, you know. So it's the unexpected places that really are my favorite places. When I, we go to the Philippines, I mean, we feel really important there and because uh, we have totally snowed these people. And uh, they're really beautiful, wonderful, enthusiastic people. So anywhere we go that, that that's the type of environment we're in, that's our favorite place. And it changes all the time. To dovetail onto that, I'd like to know where would you like to tour that you haven't been, and how much control do you have over the schedule? You know, we're going to tour for eight weeks, nine I weeks. I can't hear anything. I'm oh, a rock question. band. Sorry. I can, so I you, can you do know, it. I can do it. He can, he can uh, translate. The question is, uh, any place that you want to tour that you, that you haven't, and how much control, how much say do you have in the, uh, in the scheduling and the, and the tour planning. Yeah, there's a really, really mean guy at my management company named Bob McGlynn. <laughs> if Bob's listening, you're a really mean guy. Uh, no, but the truth is he's, he's incredibly good at, uh, at what he does, and that's getting us to play music in front of people all over the world. And a lot of times I'll be like, hey, man, we're getting a lot of tweets from Africa. We have a big song in Africa. Can we go there? And he will be like, here's, what's, here's where we're at with the world, and here's how big the world is. And if we go there, then here's what there's a problem with, and we can't get the right venue. There's so much to do with all of it. So I do want to go to Africa. That's the place that I want to go to because we've never, we've never been. Uh, we've never been to India I'd love to go there. We had a festival that was scheduled to, we were going to play there with Coldplay last year, and something got canceled. And so, you know, festivals are a tricky business where the ones that, that do well, they, they, they've figured out how to, you know, they become their own identity. And then the, the bands, like no matter who you are, you just want to play there. And it's not about money or anything. It's about being a part of something that works and people love. And... Most festivals, like restaurants, fail. And many of them just go out of business, one after another after another. And then there's the, the small handful that do really well. So people all over the world are trying to come up with festivals, and so much has to do with like the name. And that first year is crucial, because if you bring the right bands and attitude and vibe in, then it can be a success. So, I mean, you know... We'd love to do festivals in the UK and all over Europe and India and Africa, and it's just a, it's a trial and error everywhere all around the world. A lot of these places do one festival and that's it, you know. Well, it's like what you were saying about the difference between, having, you know, people loving a song and loving the band. Yep. With festivals, if they get to that place where people just want to go, whoever's playing, right. then they're in a certain place. If it's each time they've got to win you back over through 
who they're bringing and but what they're doing. Prove, if they're fighting if, at each time, that's a different... Right, and if you prove to win them over, you know, three, four, five times in a row, then people just buy tickets in advance before they even know who's playing. That's what we try to do when our, with our live tours. Is like, if you trust us after the, you've seen us for the last four summers, you, you can trust us again, because we really care a lot, and we really want it to be better and cooler than the last time. Not always bigger, because bigger isn't always better but definitely different and inclusive. We, we want to include people and figure out how to get them more involved. And so we're, we're always trying to do different things. Like, well, this year, because I do a podcast, we'll have a podcast tent when you enter the facility, and then you can be on the podcast. You can, like, do liners, ask questions, uh, give me money. <laughs> What's up? What do you like? Obviously, you're... Excited about the podcast thing? Oh, really? Tell I, me, I didn't even. Know yeah, yeah. Today. Tell me, what's what is that? You know, what does that let you do? That's that, well, that's new for you. You know, years ago, I realized that we play a lot of festivals and and go play venues all over the world, and no bands ever talk to each other because you're all trying to out cool each other or whatever the thing is. And then when you finally do talk to one another, you realize that you're all just pretty shy, and. It's like saying hi to a pretty girl. There's a good chance she's just going to blow you off. So you just don't want the humiliation. When you have a podcast, there's a reason to go up to somebody that you might be a fan of and not be embarrassed. If you say, hey, I do a podcast. I'd love to talk to you, do a song with you. Here's my card. Let's do this next time. Or how about now? And then you find how open people are to everything. And so I think that... that uh, I do this podcast with, with a guy named Pergo and my friend Jerry who plays music, and I think we're the only ones that do what we do, and it's been about two years, so we play music with them, talk to them, uh, and um, it seems to be something that, you know, we'll go to the UK or, you know, in Australia or wherever, and we'll walk into a radio station and people say, man, we love the podcast, you know, uh, hope you still do it for the rest of your life, and yeah, it makes absolutely zero money. I mean, this is a money pit, this thing. I'm getting killed. <laughs> it's a big, big production expenses <laughs> right. and values. Big around, production. Like that. costs yeah. almost 11 bucks every time we do it. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Hi. I would like to know your opinion about these music streaming platforms like Spotify and Tidal now. Because some artists, they are complaining they don't make any money out of this platform. So I'd like to know what yeah. you think about it. You, you know, as, as I was telling Alan earlier, uh, I have a writer who's a friend of mine named David Wilde. And he put it the best way. He was like, the music world, the music business world, really was lopsided for a long, long time. Uh, the, the, the suits at record companies were making enormous money, taking helicopters everywhere because they didn't want to drive, you know. Then this switch started to happen. Record companies were folding. Uh, the big fat artists weren't getting so big and fat. And people were getting access to more and more and more music, good and bad. YouTube, everything's happening, right? Kids don't buy records anymore. They listen to YouTube or, or, or AOL. They, they, they listen to the internet. Now the switch is so lopsided the other way that it's dangerous because as David was saying to me, he's like, now these kids that might have music talent might not choose music because the chances of making money in music now are worse than ever. So not only do you have to be humongous, like Hosier was able to break through this year, and he, he's going to have a career, hopefully. But like Gautier, he had one huge breakthrough song, and you haven't heard from him in a while. Uh, Macklemore, like that guy needs to come out with some magic next. You know, he's going to be fine, because I think he made like a jagillion dollars on his first album. But the truth is, is that very few artists break through every year. Most of us don't break through. And these kids might just go like, I might just go work for AOL because this is not going to make me any dough. And then AOL is going to be like, hey, we're going to Spotify and we're going to start streaming and you're not going to make any money with us either. Uh, 
But no, the truth is, is like, it's just, you hope that it figures itself out. I love Spotify. You know, I don't want to pull my songs from there. Like, uh, I, I, I don't, I just want these kids to have a chance to, you know, I, I want there to be a, 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 a great future artist that will take a chance on music because he knows that there's a chance for him to pay his rent. Everybody, thank you in the audience. Thank you, everybody watching out in the world. Pat Monahan, thank you, sir. The new album, Bulletproof Picasso, is out now. The Picasso at the Wheel tour starts next month. See you on the road. Great. See you out there. Thanks.